Hi, I'm Juliet. I'm a writer and historian, and I run a podcast called Creepy Classics, where I retell ancient, medieval and early modern ghost stories. I have new episodes every two months. On this YouTube channel, I'm mostly going to be posting some shorter videos taken from my TikTok channel, uh, Creepy Classics, at Classical JG. But I'll also, roughly once a month, be posting a podcast episode, alternating between a classic one and a new one. Enjoy! The Story of Marathon The warlord Callimachus stood over the carcass of the goat and poked the entrails delicately with a stick. The general Stesilaus leaned over his shoulder and harumphed a bit. Callimachus looked back at Stesilaus, his eyes steely. Stesilaus blinked, nodded, and Callimachus turned to the waiting army. The omens are in our favour, Callimachus cried. To war! Tolmus was in the Athenian front line. 10,000 Athenians, Plataeans and slaves against 25,000, no, 50,000, no, 100,000, surely, Persians. The enemy was a mile away, but the Athenians, once loosed, clamoured across the distance in what felt like no time at all. They were all in a frenzy, hair coming loose under their helmets, spears wobbling in hands, screaming and shouting. They ran across the plain, the shadow of a great old tomb looming up behind them. Some ancient Barrow-style monument to the long dead, casting its shadow across their headlong rush to their fate. Arrows rained down around them and Tolmus heard the screams of his few comrades unlucky enough to be pierced in the neck or shoulder. But they did not forget their job. As they got closer to the Persian front line, they came together, shields overlapping, spears held above, holding tight to the line. Tolmus fell in line next to a Pizilus, their arms brushing against each other in a way that was almost comforting as their shields clanged into formation. On his other side was Kinegirus, son of Euphorion. Tolmus felt proud of being in famous company. The Persians made for a terrifying sight, their bright striped tunics over bright striped trousers standing out against the sand of the beach and the glare of the sun over the water behind them. Some wore tunics covered in square patterns in an array of colours, they came together. They clashed. Shield wall hit shield wall in a flurry of sand and sweat and blood. Tolmus saw the great warlord Callimachus hewn almost in two as they pressed ever forwards, pressing on and on around the side of the Persian army. Next to him, Epizelus took a hard knock to the shoulder but stayed standing and held the line. Tolmus could barely make out what was going on in the whirlwind of thrashing and stabbing and shoving, but he sensed that their line was pushing the Persians closer and closer to the sea. A little further on, in the middle of the beach, the Persians seemed to be gaining ground, but on the other side of the bay, as he rose and fell on a tide of wood, leather, bronze and human flesh, he could make out the Plataeans pressing the enemy to the shore as well. In between them and the Plataeans, the Persians and their Scythian allies were advancing. Tolmus could see the Scythian cavalry swaying about overhead, their stiff pointed hats jutting up above the rest from their position on horseback, shooting all around them with their bows or attacking those below with their battle axes. The general Stesilaus fell to their missiles right next to him. Tolmus found himself clambering over the general in his death throes in his attempt to keep himself moving and alive. As the lines started to crack and the battle became chaotic, he spun around and chanced to see a very strange figure. A man wearing the light tunic and wide-brimmed hat of a farmer, clothes that looked simple and rustic. He was using both hands to carry a plough and he was swinging it around, battering the heads of the enemy with it. No Persian seemed able to touch him and no arrow found him, despite his total lack of armour, and he seemed to swing his plough with absolute precision despite his hat, which must surely have obscured his view. Thomas watched him as much as he could, but he disappeared from view as he vanished into the melee. They reached the shore. They had reached the Persian ships. Kinegirus laid a hand on a ship's poop, only to have it hacked off with a Scythian battle-axe immediately. But as he fell, more Athenians took his place, and they pressed on and on, forward and further forward, into the sea. 
They were winning. It was working. The Plataeans were advancing from the other side. The Persians and the Scythians were routed. They fled. Some tried to escape by land, and the Athenians and the Plataeans and their slaves chased them down. Others hastily set sail, rowing their ships back out to sea. Ptolemus thought he was saved, but it was not to be. As the fighting died down and the Persians turned to flee, some were still trying to keep the fight going. A hugely tall soldier advanced on Ptolemus and Epizelus, his beard so full it spread all across his shield. He struck. Ptolemus went down. As he fell, he could hear Epizelus cry out, I can't see! Ptolemus! Ptolemus, where are you? I can't see! It took him a while to die, fading in and out of consciousness. He knew their victory was complete. He was surrounded by Persian bodies. He slipped away. Thomas opened his eyes. Callimachus stood over the carcass of a goat and poked its entrails delicately with a stick. Stesilaus leaned over his shoulder and harumphed a bit. Callimachus looked back at Stesilaus, his eyes steely. Stesilaus blinked, nodded, and Callimachus turned to the waiting army. The omens are in our favour, Callimachus cried. To war! What? cried Thomas, as the Athenian army surged across the plain once more, and he was borne along with them like the tide. Thomas was in the front line. Epizelus and Kinegiris fell into place on either side of him. Epizelus looked faint, almost as if he wasn't really there. Thomas looked right at him and found he could see sand, sea and swarming soldiers right through his friend's body. When their arms brushed against each other, he could barely feel it. Kinegiris, on the other hand, seemed as solid and present as ever. Thomas saw Callimachus hewn in two, and Epizelus took a hard knock to the shoulder. He saw Stesilaus fall to a Scythian arrow. He saw a man dressed like a farmer swinging a great plough around, bashing in the heads of the enemy. They reached the shore and the Persian ships. Kinegiris reached out his hand to a ship's poop, only to have it hacked off and to go down into the mush of sand and muck and bodies on the shoreline. Other Athenians took his place. The Plataeans approached from the other side of the bay. Victory was at hand. An incredibly tall man with a beard that covered his entire shield struck Tolmis down. As he fell, he could hear Epizelus cry out, I can't see! Tolmis? Tolmis, where are you? I can't see! He died slowly, surrounded by rotting Persians. Tolmis opened his eyes. Callimachus stood over the carcass of a goat and poked its entrails delicately with a stick. Stesilaus leaned over his shoulder and harumphed a bit. Callimachus looked back at Stesilaus, his eyes steely. Stesilaus blinked, nodded, and Callimachus turned to the waiting army. The omens are in our favour, Callimachus cried. To war! Was he aware? Were any of them? Tolmis thought he saw a flicker of doubt on Callimachus' face that had not been there before. As they surged forward once again, he saw Kinegiris next to him, rubbing his wrist and holding his hand to himself in a strange and protective fashion. Epizelus was unchanged, except that he seemed even less fully present than before, barely a shadow of himself. The line formed. Callimachus was cut down, Epizelus knocked. Stesilaus was killed. The mysterious farmer swung his plough. They reached the ships. Kinegiris lost his hand and went down. The tall man with the great beard struck Thomas down while Epizelus cried out that he could not see. This time, as he lay dying, Thomas saw a line of new people emerge from the countryside to stand above the plain and look down on them. They were hazy, as if he was seeing them through the textured air of the desert, and shadowy like Epizelus. He recognised their insignia, they were elite Spartan officers. The Spartans, who had refused Pheidippides the Runner's call for help because, they said, they needed to celebrate their festival first. Clean, well-muscled, untouched by war. They stood there looking down, counting the Persian corpses. They nodded to each other in satisfaction and moved away. Tolmis closed his eyes. Callimachus poked at the entrails of the goat, and Stesilaus nodded his assent. To war! They ran across the plain, the line formed, Callimachus was cut down, Epizelus knocked, Stesilaus was killed, 
The mysterious farmer swung his plough. They reached the ships. Kinigirus lost his hand and went down. The tall man with the great beard struck Tolmis down while Epizelus cried out that he could not see. As he lay there, Tolmis became aware of movement around him. Still hazy, still shadowy, still seen through that weird desert air. More men, Athenians and Plataeans and slaves, digging, burying. But not properly. Not properly! Why weren't they taking them home? They had fallen in battle, heroes of Athens. They deserved the most beautiful spot in the great cemetery outside the walls. Why weren't they taking them home? But no, all of them, Greek and Persian alike, all were being buried on the plain of Marathon itself. There were so many bodies, they were burying them in such haste. Athenians over there, Plataeans over there, slaves over there. Persians scooped up into a pile, half burnt and dumped. Tolmis actually felt the moment his own physical remains were pulled away and thrown into the heap, as he remained where he was, slowly dying all over again. A sculptor was inscribing a monument with the names of the dead. They placed it carefully by the old burial mound and its properly buried ancient bones. Not enough! They would tell everyone back home that they had taken great care with the burial, that all the proper rites had been observed. Not true! Darkness came down over Tolmis' eyes. Callimachus poked at the entrails of the goat and Stesilaus nodded his assent. To war! They ran across the plain. The line formed. Callimachus was cut down. Epizelus knocked. Stesilaus was killed. The mysterious farmer swung his plough. They reached the ships. Kinigirus lost his hand and went down. The tall man with the great beard struck Tolmis down while Epizelus cried out that he could not see. And on. And on. And on. Over and over and over again. Sometimes Tolmis caught sight of more shadow people on the edges of his vision, wandering around the field. They stood before the inscription that bore his name, along with Callimachus and Stesilaus and Kinigirus and all the rest of the dead. A tall marble column was erected near the barrow in their memory. But they weren't there! What good would that do? Epizelus appeared fainter and fainter with each passage through the battle. Then came a time when he disappeared altogether. Tolmis ran forward to join the line, but only Kinigirus fell in beside him. Stesilaus fell, but there was no Epizelus taking a blow by Tolmis' side. When the great man with the great beard appeared, he cut Tolmis down in eerie silence, leaving him to lie there and die alone. Epizelus is at peace, he thought to himself. He has died, he has been buried, properly buried, at home with honour. He has gone. Lucky him. Callimachus poked at the entrails of the goat and Stesilaus nodded his assent. To war! They ran across the plain, the line formed. Callimachus was cut down, Stesilaus was killed. The mysterious farmer swung his plough, they reached the ships. Kinigirus lost his hand and went down, the tall man with the great beard struck Tolmis down. On and on and on it went, the years blurring together in an endless cycle of life and death. The clothes of the shadow people started to change. Instead of simple tunics and cloaks, some men started appearing in elaborate white folded garments with a red stripe, surrounded by slaves and hangers-on. One of them took away the stone slabs bearing their names. Didn't seem to make much difference, except to make everything seem even clearer and more real somehow. Callimachus poked at the entrails of the goat and Stesilaus nodded his assent. To war! They ran across the plain, the line formed. Callimachus was cut down, Stesilaus was killed. The mysterious farmer swung his plough, they reached their ships. Kinigirus lost his hand and went down. The tall man with the great beard struck Tolmis down. And again, and again, and again. The men in the elaborate garments slowly stopped coming. Clothing became simple again. And then less so. People started to appear in eastern-looking garb, rich clothes covered in gold and bright colours and patterns of squares and stripes. The marble column was torn down and used in the building of a stone tower with crenellations at the top. The men around him felt more solid, the blood warmer and more wet than ever. Callimachus poked at the entrails of the goat and Stesilaus nodded his assent. To war! They ran across the plain, the line formed. Callimachus was cut down, Stesilaus was killed, the mysterious farmer swung his plough, they reached the ships. Kinigirus lost his hand and went down, the tall man with the great beard struck Tolmis down. It went on. People continued to come, the shadow people, wandering around the field, staring at the ancient barrow. It was still there. Their memorial slab was long gone, their monument folded into someone else's defensive tower, but there remained the barrow, looming over the plain. 
Callimachus poked at the entrails of the goat and Stesilaus nodded his assent. To war! They ran across the plain the line formed. Callimachus was cut down, Stesilaus was killed. The mysterious farmer swung his plough. They reached the ships. Kinagiris lost his hand and went down. The tall man with the great beard struck Thomas down. The clothing on the shadow people changed and changed again. For a long time they were dominated by men in beautiful coloured robes worn with loose trousers and large turbans. Slowly people in quite different looking clothing started to appear, and even some women. Very pale-skinned, these women, they looked as if they hardly ever ventured outside. They wore dresses with great voluminous skirts that dragged as they walked across the sand of the beach. But still more frequently he saw men in tight-fitting woollen jackets and even tighter-fitting trousers with big boots covering their feet and legs. And these people were not just looking. Some of them were starting to dig. What were they digging for? Were they trying to unearth their bones? Would they be freed if they did? A man in a neat navy blue jacket and an equally neat white powdered wig came and dug up a bit of the old barrow tomb. He did not seem impressed with what he found. He set up some kind of small white board on a wooden frame and painted a picture of the plain, took a few arrowheads he had found in the ground and went away. Callimachus poked at the entrails of the goat and Stesilaus nodded his assent. To war! They ran across the plain. The line formed. Callimachus was cut down. Stesilaus was killed. The mysterious farmer swung his plough. They reached the ships. Kinagiris lost his hand and went down. The tall man with the great beard struck Tolmis down. While they fought their unending war, on and on, the shadow people started to repeat a pattern as well. Different people. These were living, moving and changing people, not souls stuck in an unending loop. The people changed, their clothes changed, their servants and their tools changed. But their pattern soon fixed itself. They came, they dug up a bit of the field, usually the ancient barrow, they took some arrowheads, they left. A rich couple, the man in red jacket and tall powdered wig, the woman dark-haired and sad-looking. A man in a bigger jacket without a wig, a mop of dark hair blowing in the sea breeze. He painted a picture of the plane on a block of white board as well. Another in a dark jacket and again no wig, they seem to have gone now, his hair a bit neater. He spent a long time scouring the ground for arrowheads. Callimachus poked at the entrails of the goat and Stesilaus nodded his ascent. To war! They ran across the plain. The line formed. Callimachus was cut down. Stesilaus was killed. The mysterious farmer swung his plough. They reached the ships. Kinagiris lost his hand and went down. The tall man with the great beard struck Thomas down. Much later. A man wearing a long fur coat that fell to his ankles and a tall black hat. A great black moustache plastered across his face, flicking up across his cheeks. A woman who came with him had dark hair piled up on top of her head and wore a gold necklace of a type Thomas had not seen since he left home, however many thousands of years ago that was. They dug right into the ancient mound. A little while later, another man in a dark suit with an even bigger moustache. He dug so deep into that mound, he found the ashes and charred bones of the long-ago people who had been buried there. And he thought it was them. Callimachus poked at the entrails of the goat and Stesilaus nodded his assent. To war! They ran across the plain, the line formed. Callimachus was cut down, Stesilaus was killed, the mysterious farmer swung his plough, they reached the ships, Kinagiris lost his hand and went down, the tall man with the great beard struck Tolmis down. Great excitement among the shadow people. They put up a new marble monument, a replica of the old one. They replaced the list of the dead as best they could. The battle around Tolmis started to feel a little fainter, a little less real. But it did not stop. The shadow people flocked to the old barrow, Women's dresses got shorter and more and more of them started to come, some of them dressed like men, some of them wearing almost nothing in the days of the summer heat. Men's moustaches got smaller and then bigger and then disappeared. It made no difference. It would never end. Tolmis tried to let go of all hope. Hope was a kicker. Every time the shadow people turned up with tools and shovels, he thought, this is it, this is the time. They will dig deep enough, they will dig in the right places, they will find us. They will put us to rest, properly, and this eternal battle will end. He could not take it any more. No, he tried to tell himself, it will never happen. Stop hoping. Stop watching. Just go through the cycle. That is all you can do. That is all you will ever do. Callimachus poked the entrails of the goat and Stesilaus nodded his ascent. To war! They ran across the plain. The line formed. Callimachus was cut down. Stesilaus was killed. The mysterious farmer swung his plough. They reached the ships. Kinagiris lost his hand and went down. The tall man with the great beard struck Thomas down. More digging. Not for arrowheads, those were all long gone. Organised digging, by people with maps and diagrams and books and charts, and strange equipment Tolmis could not begin to recognise or understand. It started and stopped with the seasons, it paused for a while, but it kept on going. The shadow people kept on coming. Tolmis could not help it. 
he started to hope again. The end. Hi, I'm Juliet Harrison. Welcome back to Creepy Classics, the podcast retelling and discussing ancient medieval and early modern ghost stories with episodes every two months. So I was reading a book called Wrong Place, Wrong Time by my friend Gillian McAllister, which is about a character who goes backwards through time. And it talked a bit about time loops. And I love time loops. Um, They're one of my favourite kind of types of episode (laughs) in sci-fi fantasy shows. So I thought, oh, it would be really good fun to do a time loop um, for the podcast and I also knew that I wanted to cover some of these stories about haunted battlefields but I didn't really know what to do with them because a lot of the time with a haunted battlefield all you've got is just there was a battle and if you go there you can hear the sounds of the battle which isn't a whole lot of plot. (laughs) Um, So uh, when I say the the book actually isn't a time loop it's a reverse journey through time but um, it reminded me of this idea and I thought I know I'll put them together because the, I can follow a character trapped in a time loop who is repeating the battle that he died in and that's the the kind of source of the ghost story so the idea here is that obviously the story is told from the point of view of the ghost or one of the ghosts I should say uh, this would be about 192 Athenians I can't remember how many Plataeans and slaves and several 6,000 or more Persians. <laughs> so there's a lot available on the Battle of Marathon. I will um, uh, sort of give a, a list of some of the sources I used um, at the end of this episode. I am also very much not an expert in military history, so I am kind of relying on other experts for any of the specifics of the military side, the battle, the battlefield site, the archaeological excavation, none of this is my field of expertise. Um, but I have done my best to hopefully reasonably accurately recreate the Battle of Marathon and then tell it over and over and over again. Um, so the the spark for this is from Pausanias, his description of Greece. Uh, he describes the whole, as you can tell by the title, he describes the whole of Greece. He describes the shrines and statues and folklore, local folklore from each place. And he goes around the whole of Greece. This is uh, about second century CE, Roman period, but Pausanias is a Greek writer. And he says, at Marathon, every night you can hear horses neighing and men fighting. No one who has expressly set himself to behold this vision has ever got any good from it, but the spirits are not angry with those who in ignorance chance to see it. The Marathonians worship both those who died in the fighting, calling them heroes, and Marathon, from whom the parish derives its name. So I left out the hero worship of the soldiers because there wasn't room for it. I did make sure to mention cavalry because Pausanias mentions horses neighing. There is some debate between scholars about whether there were any cavalry um, at the Battle of Marathon. But basically, all my decisions about kind of what I was going to include of the history of the battle were primarily determined by my need to fulfil this ghost story. So um, proper, accurate military history had to take second place to, well, the ghost story says that you can hear them fighting and there's horses there. And the basis of my story is that they weren't buried properly. And again, this may or may not be the case, historically speaking. It is certainly claimed, usually, that they were buried properly. Uh, The ancient historians certainly claimed they were buried properly with memorials. There are some unusual aspects, though. So the later historian Thucydides says that the dead from Marathon were buried on the field of battle, which at that time was unusual. The more usual thing was to bring the bodies home and bury them in the cemetery at Athens. There's also this uh, barrow on the site called the Soros or the Tumulus. And this has frequently been identified as the grave of the 192 Athenian soldiers who died. But there is some doubt about whether that is the case. So what I did, knowing I needed them to be trapped in this endless time loop 
of repeating this battle over and over again because that was the point of the story. Um, so I had to come up with a reason that this had happened to them. So uh, I decided that they had not been properly buried, that the barrow isn't actually them, um, and that it was this lack of proper burial um, brought about partly by the fact they were buried on the field and not taken back to Athens that had led to them being kind of trapped in uh, this eternal... I, I kept trying to stop myself saying the word purgatory because, of course, we're centuries pre-Christian. Um, we're millennia before the idea of purgatory. So I spent the entire thing forcing myself not to use the word purgatory, even though it would have quite nicely described what was happening to them. Improper burial is actually a really common reason for ghosts to be restless in ancient ghost stories and actually in lots of ghost stories from different times and periods. I think I've talked about it on this podcast probably quite a few times before. Um, it comes up a lot. So when I was trying to work out why would the soldiers at Marathon be trapped in this eternal time loop where they're repeating this battle over and over again, uh, not being buried properly just made the most sense as a reason. So it may not be accurate, although it might be, uh, to what happened to the, the bodies of the people at Marathon, um, but it certainly works as an explanation for why Pausanias says centuries later the battlefield is still haunted. That would be a sensible reason to a Greek or Roman as well as uh, even to a, a modern paranormal expert, why spirits might not be at rest and especially why large numbers of them. There are other theories. If it was a haunted battlefield, um, there are theories around the idea that places record um, experiences of high trauma and high emotion. Uh, that's often a, a common explanation for a haunted battlefield, um, that uh, it's not actually the souls of the dead soldiers. Um, it's actually... Uh, a recording, if you like, uh, that uh, when you see or hear battles at a battlefield, you're actually, it's almost like watching a videotape. The events have been recorded onto the landscape through a combination of uh, emotion, trauma and weather conditions. Um, and that would not involve the souls of the dead soldiers at all. Uh, but obviously that does not make quite such a good story. <laughs> if I wanted to tell a story from the point of view of the soul of a soldier who died at Marathon, then they had to be really haunting it as dead spirits. Uh, it couldn't be some kind of videotape style recording. Um, so that's why I went with the improper burial explanation, even though uh, if we were talking about real haunted battlefields, um, assuming that you are... Uh, looking for a paranormal explanation um, and not uh, a scientific one, um, the, the kind of recordings theory um, would be the more likely. I took the name Tolmis from the partially preserved Marathon stone, which we think is the actual ancient stone that recorded the names of the, the dead, the, the Athenians who died in the battle. Um, I got the details of that from Diana Wright's blog, uh, which I'll list later. It seems to have been taken away by an Athenian millionaire called Herodes Atticus in the first century CE. So he was a Roman citizen, that's Roman period, uh, also an Athenian. Uh, it has been noted by Pausanias that this is the first time slaves fought alongside free men. So we're looking for burials for Athenians, Plataeans, slaves and then Persians, um, some of which we may or may not have found. I uh, started with the animal sacrifice that would be carried out by the generals before a battle. Uh, Greek priesthoods are kind of quite practical roles involving looking after the temples. Um, so the sacrifice would be carried out by the general, um, although he would probably have some slaves or priests or servants to help him clean up and do the messy parts. Uh, but they were carried out by the generals themselves directly. They didn't get a priest to do it. And that's described by Xenophon. Uh, as well as depicted on vases. The numbers of each army are very approximate. Some ancient sources suggest the Persian army was much bigger. I just went with a guess. <laughs> just needed to put something. The running start, described by Herodotus, where the Athenians run across uh, an ancient mile, uh, was unusual. And I'll list an article on that later. Uh, the man who is dressed like a farmer and swinging a plough around, if you have a look at images of ancient Greek ploughs, you'll see they're kind of a long stick type thing. Uh, that's another story from Pausanias. Um, 
around the same sort of section where he talks about the people hearing the spirits. He also mentions that there were stories that people saw this strange man in rustic dress um, swinging a plough around during the battle, uh, and he says they later worshipped him as he of the plough tail. And the tall man who kills Tolmis in my story is described by Herodotus. Uh, he says, um, a certain Athenian, Epizelus, lost his sight, but was neither stabbed in any part nor shot. He was blind for the rest of his life. He said a tall man at arms had encountered him uh, and the man's beard spread all over his shield and that this apparition passed Epizelus by but killed his neighbour in the line. So I made Tolmis his neighbour in the line who was killed by this strange man in Epizelus, the survivor, um, who then goes blind. I suspect um, most people have heard of the Battle of Marathon, at least briefly, um, even without the details, because it gave its name to Marathon Running Races. So this battle took place in 490 BCE during the first of the Greco-Persian Wars. This was two invasions uh, of Persia into the various Greek city-states. So Greece at this time is not a unified country. It's a collection of separate city-states. Um, and uh, Darius, the king of Persia, led the first invasion in 490 and the second uh, was led by his son Xerxes, 480 to 79. So Marathon is one of the early battles in this war. Uh, so the Athenians decided to fight um, Darius's forces at Marathon. They sent a runner who is called either Phidippides or Philippides, depending on the source, to Sparta to ask for help. Herodotus says he was a runner of long distances and made that his calling. And he supposedly ran 140 miles to Sparta by the next day uh, and stopped and had a vision of Pan on the way as well, according to Herodotus. Uh, this was no good. The Spartans refused to come because they were celebrating a festival of Apollo called the Carnea and they couldn't march until the next full moon. This happens frequently in, in these uh, histories with Spartans. It happens again later. Um, they may have been deeply religious. They may have been worried that their uh, serf slaves, the helots, were going to revolt. Uh, who knows why they actually refused to come. But they refused to come until the next full moon. Uh, so the Athenians and the Plataeans and the slaves had to fight by themselves. Uh, they were directed by a general called Miltiades, who I left out of my story. I wanted to keep it tightly focused on these kind of collection of individuals named by Herodotus. Uh, so all the names of the characters in my story um, come from Herodotus, except for Tolmis, who comes from the, um, the Marathon Stone. Um, so they're all people who Herodotus describes being killed in the battle. Um, and the Athenians had 10 generals, uh, strategoi, um, Miltiades among them. Uh, they managed to defeat the Persians using a pincer movement. Uh, the Athenians also had better armour and longer spears. Uh, so even though they were he heavily outnumbered, uh, they were able to uh, win the battle. And eventually the Spartans turned up quite a bit later to survey the Persian corpses and sort of go, well done. So the Barrow tomb on the site, the Soros, has long been identified as the tomb of the Athenians, the 192 Athenians who died. But there are scholars who think it isn't, uh, including David Meadows, uh, known to the internet as the rogue classicist, um, and a scholar called Peter Fromhertz. And in my case, my story only works if it isn't the tomb of the Athenians, so... Obviously, I'm going with that. Uh, there is evidence there that indicates it dates back to the 6th century BCE, so actually only a few decades before my story takes place. Um, not quite as ridiculously old as I had Thomas think it is, but Thomas is not a professional historian. He just knows it's old. Uh, there have been lots of attempts to identify the tombs of the Plataeans, of the slaves, of the Athenians. Nobody's found anything that looks like a burial site for the Persians. Um... As far as I can tell, that's we're still looking. It is currently being excavated. Uh, modern excavations um, started up again in 2014 uh, and resumed in 2022 after a break due to COVID. They have found um, the burial of a child, uh, which is older than the Battle of Marathon. Obviously, you wouldn't expect a child's burial at a battle site anyway. But uh, it looks like it dates um, back earlier much earlier so hopefully they might uh, find some more with any luck tomb of the persians would be a nice start 
I also have lots of details in this, of course, about the history of dress, <laughs> constantly referring to clothing. Uh, the description of the Athenians being kind of frightened by the clothing of the Persians actually comes from Herodotus. He talks about that in his description of the battle. Uh, and there's an article by Christopher Tuplin that talks about it further. I've described their clothing based on Greek vases and Persian sculptures. Um, so sort of put them together. I'm also describing what's called hoplite warfare. This was the form of warfare in the classical period in Greece, uh, where soldiers would line up with overlapping shields and essentially shove the enemy and try to poke them over the top of the shields with spears. So you have helmet and breastplate, uh, and you have spear, shield, and a stabbing sword for emergency. So if you lose your spear, or if you end up in close combat, you have a, a sword to stab with, but spear and shield are the primary weapons. The shield would be made of wood or leather and covered in bronze. And then I have followed um, the history of fashion, because <laughs> Tolmis then, over the centuries and millennia, sees the, the shadows of the living people coming to visit the site, and this has been a famous site ever since the battle and has had many visitors. So, of course, I've given a sort of um, vague outline of the history of fashion. Uh, I have assumed that in the medieval period, um, the Byzantine Empire would have an Eastern-influenced fashion. So to Tolmis, an Athenian who died fighting Persians, it looks like they've been influenced by the East. Um, it's actually a Byzantine Empire. And then uh, Greece is then conquered by the Ottomans, becomes part of the Ottoman Empire. That's where the turbans come in. And then I described various 18th, 19th and 20th century people based on uh, images, portraits uh, of them that are available. Heinrich Schliemann could be quite the snazzy dresser in his youth. He wore a very long dark fur coat and a top hat in a photograph. Looks very stylish. His second wife, Sophie, was once photographed wearing what they were calling the jewels of Helen. Now, Helen is a fictitious mythological character, but they had excavated the jewels um, from an ancient site. And um, she was photographed wearing this ancient jewellery. So I basically assumed that they'd nicked a necklace for her. And that's what Tolmis sees her wearing. You can see those images um, online on Wikipedia. So the various people that Tolmis sees uh, visiting the battlefield. First of all, he sees the Spartans who show up a few days, a couple of weeks later after the full moon. Uh, those are the first group. Later, he sees Herodes Atticus taking away the memorial slab and he sees unnamed Roman citizens in togas. He sees unnamed Byzantine people building a medieval tower that they use the material from the monument to build. In 1788, he sees Louis-François Sébastien Fauvel, who was a painter, antiquarian and French consul in Athens who did a small dig at the Soros. In 1801, he sees an infamous member of the British aristocracy, Thomas Bruce, the seventh Earl of Elgin, and his first wife, Mary. And by the way, I don't have time to go into it, but these people have fascinating lives. Um, Mary apparently went off and had an affair, and they actually got divorced, which for very early 19th century England is extraordinary. Um, and then they both remarried. But anyway, this is the first wife, Mary. Um, they are in the middle of the process of taking the Parthenon marbles from the Acropolis in Athens and sending them over to England to eventually be put in the British Museum. Uh, this is a controversial act that is still being argued. The Greeks are very keen to have the marbles back again. The British Museum are equally keen to hang on to them. Uh, it is a very complex issue, which again, I do not have time to go into right now. Uh, but that's him. That's uh, that's Elgin um, and his wife uh, stealing arrowheads um, from the plain of Marathon, along with many other uh, 18th and 19th century visitors who were all doing it. Um, this is the treasure hunting phase of uh, archaeology. And Elgin is, of course, infamous for taking things and sending them back to Britain. So I'm sure he took plenty of arrowheads with him. Uh, then Thomas sees Irish painter Edward Dodwell, who's the second one to paint it. There would have been more people painting it. I obviously just cherry-picked a few people to describe rather than go through everybody who ever visited Marathon. Uh, then he sees Sir William Gell, another visitor. Then he sees uh, Heinrich Schliemann doing a dig in 1884. So Schliemann is most famous for excavating the sites of uh, Troy, Vizalik, uh, which is where they got these so-called jewels of Helen. 
um, in modern Turkey and the site of Mycenae in Greece, um, where he unearthed a, a gold death mask uh, of a Bronze Age Mycenaean king and said, I have looked upon the face of Agamemnon. Again, Agamemnon is fictional, uh, but he was very, very into uh, Greek mythology, the poems of Homer, stories of the Trojan War, and he was always looking for uh, evidence of, of that war and what was in those poems. And he tended to just kind of destroy everything else, looking for that period as well. Uh, and then Thomas sees Valerios Stais, uh, who's a Greek who excavated the site in the early 20th, late 19th, early 20th century and who identified the Soros as the grave of the 192 Athenians. And that identification has more or less stood, but as I mentioned earlier, there are some people who don't agree with it. Finally, he sees the modern excavation starting in 2014 with a COVID break by the Department of Archaeology and History of Art of the National and Capodistrian University of Athens. So I used a lot of sources putting this together. Um, as I say, I'm not an expert in military history. I have some knowledge of uh, dress history, but uh, not in detail. Um, I am not an expert in the archaeology of the Plain of Marathon. Uh, there's quite a lot available online uh, from fairly reliable sources uh, talking about Marathon. So the primary sources are Pausanias uh, 1.32.3-5, which is available at theoi.com in their classical texts collection. Herodotus 6.117 and also 6.112-116 describing the battle. Uh, that's available at Lacus Curtius or at perseus.tufts.edu. And Thucydides 2.34.5 on the burial of the uh, dead from Marathon, which is also available at perseus.tufts.edu. The Modern Excavation has a website, marathonexcavations.arch.uoa.gr. I had a look at David Meadows' Marathon Musings on his Rogue Classicism blog. I had a look at an object biography of uh, Marathon Spearheads from uh, ox.ac.uk. I had a look at a blog from sas.ac.uk on Monuments of Marathon. Uh, and uh, the blog on the Marathon Stone at surprisedbytime.blogspot.com on that uh, Marathon Stone that was taken by Herodes Atticus. I also had a look at descriptions of different types of toga at tastesofhistory.co.uk just to make sure that the white toga with the red stripe was actually an ancient um, thing and not a modern one. Um, there was a particular type of toga that was white with a red stripe, so we're fine. It's a genuine Roman thing and not just uh, toga parties. So those are all available freely online. If you have access to academic journals via JSTOR, I also looked at Peter Fromhertz's The Battle of Marathon, the Tropion Herodotus and E. Curtius. Uh, that's from Historia Zeitschrift für Alte Geschichte. Uh, the Bulletin of the Institute of Classical Studies did a supplement on Marathon to commemorate the 2,500 year anniversary. Uh, and I looked at a couple of articles from that. Uh, I looked at Ariadne Gautziutati's God's Heroes in the Battle of Marathon and Christopher Tuplin's Intolerable Clothes and a Terrifying Name, uh, Characteristics of an Achaemenid Invasion Force. I also had a look at Gordon Shrimpton's article, The Persian Cavalry at Marathon in Phoenix. <laughs> so I uh, hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. I really enjoyed researching it. Goodness knows how well I have portrayed the Battle of Marathon. Um, but I, I did find it really interesting. Basically, everything I've talked about is far more detailed and far more complicated than I've had time to talk about. And all of those blogs um, and websites that I just cited are really long and have tons of detail. So if this is something that you're interested in, I would definitely recommend checking out those various blog posts um, because there's so much more. And even just like I said, the, the personal histories of some of these 19th century people are fascinating in themselves. So there's a heck of a lot more to discover about this whole uh, topic. Um, but hopefully that's been an interesting start. And uh, thank you to Jill for writing Wrong Place, Wrong Time and giving me the idea to do a time loop episode. 
Uh, so we will be back uh, at the end of June uh, with another episode of Creepy Classics. Thank you for listening. Creepy Classics was written and performed by Juliet Harrison. Music composed and performed by Ed Harrison with vocals by Olivia Knops. It was produced by Juliet Harrison with assistance from Newman University.